first of all, I would like to thank you for being here today with us during this virtual presentation of the report Exploitation of Lithium in Mexico or Extractive Transnational Extraction. We are here in different parts of this continent from Mexico, Bolivia, and Canada. Me, for example, I am in Montreal. I'm in the traditional territory of the Kanihekaha people. I'm Viviana Herrera, and I'm the coordinator for the program of America Latina and Mining Watch Canada. The report, Exploitation of Lithium in Mexico, Public Interest in, the, in Transnational Interest is what gets us together today and what has us really ex excited for the people ex affected by mining and in Canada as well. This report is the result of over a year of collective work, and it tries to give a follow-up from a first and very successful report that we published in 2021 titled Lithium, the new commercial dispute dynamized by the fake uh, green market. The report, Exploitation of Lithium in Mexico, which is what we are launching today, is trying to question in a very rigorous way and a very judgmental way, what incorrectly has been called the nationalization of lithium in Mexico, a discourse managed by the government and repeated without end through the media and others that lacks analysis, lacks a critical analysis. Actually, it is very funny because this launch came at a very perfect moment it accords with the announcement of the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, who last week announced a decree, a new decree for nationalization for lithium. In this sense, the, the report that we are presenting tonight, today, what it tries to do is to give the elements to question profoundly this kind of announcements and debates that have come up in Mexico about this supposed need of extracting lithium as part of a transition, uh, energetic transition, transition worldwide, and that this extractivism is part of a project that strengthens national sovereignty. However, as we will see today, the report shows a very clear way that actually this wave that's extractivist in Mexico is dynamized by a new neoliberal po policy of the treaty between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And what is moving forward is a project that's directly related to the private capital of high risk, with a high risk for the public, and that is based on the displacement of the people and its territories. On the other side, and to contextualize the project of exploitation of lithium in Mexico, it, the report also talks about the Bolivian case. We know that people that follow the lithium subject in Mexico, we know that the Mexican government has declared in many occasions that this project of lithium in Mexico, it follows this paradigm of the Bolivian process. With the report, we try to go further in these discourses and understand exactly how it has been managed, how this process has been managed of industrialization of lithium in Bolivia. And so today we have the network of people that are affected by minor mining in Mexico. We also have the Center of Documentation and in Bolivia, CEVIT. And uh, also with a professor from the university, uh, uh, the Autonoma University in Mexico, uh, I will pre I will present them more detailed uh, way soon. Uh, finally, the presentations we will have tonight, we will also have a section for question and answers at the bottom uh, for those of you that are here today, here through Zoom. You will see that there's a little box of questions. Don't hesitate on putting your questions in there during this webinar, because at the end of the interventions, we will try to answer to them and we'll have a conversation that's very interested and uh, enriching and we will uh, about what we will share today. I would also like to present the organization uh, for the event. This is an effort together collectively between REMA and Mining Watch Canada. In Mining Watch Canada, we work with 
communities, organizations, and, and networks that fight against the problems of mining in Canada and, and Latin America and, and other parts of Mexico, including here in Canada, providing strategic support and technical support to the communities that are affected by the exploration of minerals. We also work for a world in which the indigenous people can exert their, auto, their, um, their rights and where communities may give their consent before any mining activity is realized. This work, we do it through the coalition work here in Canada and around the world. In a similar way, the network, the Mexican network of people that are affected by mining that's better known by REMA, it's a network of organizations that work for the defense of the, of the territory and against the displacement and they push forward collective action from community organizing, strengthening the exercise of auto-determination and the visibility of collective rights. Same with the articulation between communities and organizations at, at a local level, regionally and nationally, and against the extractive model that push forward activities like mining. Lastly, I would like to thank, lastly, for this part of the intro part, I would like to thank uh, and a special mention to our interpreters, Thalys and Marshda, for supporting us tonight, uh, because I feel like this event could not could not uh, be successful without you all. This really helps us that an English speaking public, for example, here in Canada, in the United States and in other parts of the world can hear about this reality of the mining, the lithium mining in countries like Mexico and Bolivia. And this also, uh, I will also remind everybody uh, that has joined in the last few minutes, perhaps, that we have interpret simultaneous interpretation available in English. And to start, I would like to invite Isabel Velasquez Quesada. Isa, could you turn on your camera and your mic, please? Isa. Isabel is a geographer. She is a professor at the University, National Autonomous University of Mexico, that is known as UNAM. And she's also a professor, and she also teaches at a distance at the, for UNAM. She's at the Colectivo Comunes member and Resona member. Both organizations are part of REMA, and from these organizations, she push for, pushes forward processes that are informative to strengthen the self-determination of communities, uh, agricultural communities. She has also participated in the investigation and redaction of reports that announce the effects of the neoliberal reforms in Mexico. Isa, would you please give us some context about the situation of mining in Mexico from the perspective of REMA, uh, presenting the main findings of the reports that we are launching today the exploitation of lithium, uh, public interest or national extractivism. You have 20 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Viviana. I hope you can all hear me well and that you're able to see the presentation. I We prepared or we would like to start contextualizing a little bit. Rema, as Viviana mentioned, is a network of organization that speaks for the defense of the land affected by mining. And we have also defined the extractive model that includes, among other projects, many projects of development that use the same strategy as mining. And as REMA, being a network that speaks from the affected communities and from the sacrifice zones created supposedly in pursuit of development, we know that mining responds to a model where in order to make the extraction of minerals a business, it generates a set of externalities intrinsic to its operation that is so violence, forced displacement and social environmental damage in perpetuity that companies, uh, public or private, never fix or pay for. This is why Rema, at REMA, we strive to do preventive work, seeking to inform communities about the, the damages that 
uh, communities suffer social, environmentally, and economically before the mining projects even begin. And to do this, we constantly monitor, are monitoring mining expansion projects in Mexico. And well, since 2019, which is when we started talking insistently about lithium in Mexico, we knew that it was necessary to pay attention to the issue because the public opinion that was beginning to be generated in this regard added elements of the pro-mining discourse that Arrema, we seek to appeal and disprove. In the report we present to you today, we have sought to develop these five ideas to question elements that we consider central to this issue, to question the elements that we consider central to this topic. The first is, which is something we began to do in the previous report, is to provide elements to question the idea that lithium extraction is necessary for what is called, in a very euphemistic phrase, we think, the energy transition and with this to question the supposed need to even and even urgency that as a society we have to exploit lithium secondly and thirdly in the report we are interested in providing arguments to refute two declarations that have been used to legitimize the actions that the mexican state has taken in relation to lithium in the report, we point out that these actions are part of a hegemonic project aligned with the interest of the US energy and automotive industry, which projects the, the direct participation of private and foreign capital companies in this project. In addition, as Lema, we are interested in clearly identifying the threats and the areas directly affected by the projection of this extractivist wave. So we updated the information we had presented in 2021 on lithium, lithium man, mining projects, taking into account only the most advanced ones. We are interested in warning about the risks of mining to the communities involved and to warn society in general about the implications of militarization and criminalization that the state can do to promote it under the cover of reforms that are being made. In this presentation, I am going to share with you very uh, briefly some of the ideas about these. We believe it is important to remember that this is not the first extractivist wave. The history of capitalism has risen from these mining fevers. One of these last ones, which was triggered by the, at the beginning of the 20th century in the heat of the process of electrification in the United, the United States, resulted in the invention of open pit mining, a form of mining that today is especially harmful and violent. Sorry, I went too far. The mining wave that we are facing Under this idea, it has generated uh, an overwhelming statement. To save the world, they say, between 2011 and 2060, it is required to increase 111% the extraction of minerals. There is much that has been questioned about the market projects associated with the so-called energy transition. Here we recover some of the arguments that we consider key that we did during the presentation that you are seeing today and some of the arguments that we considered uh, focal. But I would like to also point out the absurdity of pretending to save the world by promoting one of the most violent and damaging activities such as mining. An activity that today already generates between four and 7% of greenhouse gases worldwide, an industry branch that in Mexico alone is the one that highest consumption of electricity, an activity that has been more than pointed out as a cause of several and greatest environmental damages in the country. And uh, uh, just as an example, the case of the Sonora River, but in summary, the companies and governments claim that to save the world, as they say, mining must double the volume of exploitation, not only in territories already affected by mining activity, but from its expansion to other areas where the minerals are now required are found. We know that the takeoff of these green markets requires not only lithium, but of a very wide mineral range that we can see in this graph. In Mexico, this implies, among other things, zinc mining projected to double in demand, 
and the already very devastating copper mining, as well as expanding rare earth mining. Lithium particularly has jumped to the scene of the world and in our countries because of its role in the battery production process. But it's important to emphasize that although lithium batteries are used in many of the devices that the electronics industry produces nowadays, the sector that has driven this extractive wave around the production of batteries is, is the automobile industry. Most of the production of the lithium-based electric batteries are destined for electric cars, and only 10% are destined for electric storage and renewable power plants. And that is, in the heat of the expansion and the geopolitical rearrangement of the automotive sector in North America, that this mining fever touches land in Mexico. Starting in 2019 and increasing in the following years, this wave around lithium had a turning point in April of 2022, when it was talked about with great Grand Fair, the supposed nationalization of this resource. In this report, we expose what we consider to be the main thread of this polarized debate, and we specify the steps that were taken in two areas of dispute. That of the public opinion, where as a culmination of a dispute over the electricity sector, there was an insistence on talking about the nationalization of lithium and positioning this issue as part of a sovereignty project even forcing parallels with the expropriation of oil and the field of reforms and plans that were being advanced were what we read are rather bombastic but confusing modifications, which in fact left open the possibility of private investment in these projects. In the report, we specify in detail what changes were made. We explain why this is not a nationalization and why rather what is being promoted is a mixed capital exploitation model, even with the possibility of an alliance with foreign capital very much in tune with what is really happening in Bolivia. On the other hand, we clarify that the creation of reserve zones, which are areas where the exploitation of a mineral is carried out exclusively by the state, and which seems to be in opposition to the interests of the companies with current concessions, this rather reinforces our suspicion that what is advancing is the confirmation of a mixed business scheme with private participation contracts, like the ones that operated in a disguised way for many years in the hydrocarbon sector with the participation of private sectors through service provision contracts, or as it is today through more explicit public-private partnerships. This seems to us as a maneuver with which the state also seems to be seeking to avoid the possibility of being sued in the courts that operate within international trade agreements by the companies that in Mexico would see their interests affected by these reforms. However, we also note that in all of this, there are important changes to highlight. The inclusion of categories such as public utility and patrimony of the nation are relevant because they empower the state to take tax actions to promote these projects. We are particularly concerned that the exception created for lithium is equivalent to the one used for resources explicitly considered as strategic, since together with the new provisions, it empowers the discretional use of resources, the lack of accountability, direct expropriation, as well as the militarization and criminalization of those who oppose these projects. In their report, we were interested in showing the link, which is more evident every day, that this project has with the geopolitical interests of the United States, a project that repeats the strategies and the errors that in Latin America have brought about the promotion of extractivism as supposed levers of national development. In the case of Lithium MX and Plan Sonora, we detailed that these are projects that make that make lithium resources in Mexico available to US automotive companies for the production of individual electric automobiles. Those who today applaud the creation of lithium MX, the delivery of 235,000 hectares 
of territory of Sonora for the creation of the lithium mining reserve or the creation of Plan Sonora, they do not notice that it is the governments of the United States and Canada with whom the Mexican state pan, plans to consolidate these projects to link the processing and production chains of electric vehicles. All of this at the expense of the environment, the territories of many communities in Mexico. This plan is primarily designed to comply with the reforms made in the free trade agreement, particularly those related to the regional origin of the essential comp components of the automotive sector in a context of geopolitical dispute between the United States and China. This great projects, therefore, not only puts continuities on the table, but also increases some risks that occur within the framework of, uh, of neoliberal laws. Among them, that this territorial restructuring will increase the dependence that already exists towards the U.S. economy, and particularly the strong dependence that the northern region has on the U.S. automotive industry. And the Mexican state also has uh, sued in, in international trib tribunals. This is detailed in the report. According to the permits that the Mexican state itself has already given to companies linked to the exploitation of lithium. In the report, we present an update on the progress of the private companies associated with lithium exploitation in Mexico. And here we believe it is important to highlight some points. The review of the 36 private lithium projects that we made in the 2021 report showed many things that we have said so far as Rima that mining is a highly concentrated activity, that it is not unrelated to financial speculation. This could be seen at that time because most of the concessions that could then be associated at that time be associated with lithium extraction did not have significant advances. Many of these concessions were in process and in the hands of companies that we call junior because they have a business model that only aims to create mining projects to sell it to companies that have sufficient capital to, to carry them forward. These projects were controlled at that time by 10 companies. Most of the mining concessions were not uh, in force and only three of these projects showed significant progress. Now in this report, we update this information and follow up on projects that showed progress in the prospecting or exploration phases. In Sonora, there's two of the projects that have advanced the most. The best known project, Bacanora Lithium, or Sonora Lithium, is in the hands of the China Chinese company Gamfeng, continues to be the most advanced project and the only one that even has water concessions for its operation. In this map, we see the concessions of Bacanora Lithium, the company. In solid red are those that are in force, and in shaded red, though those that are in process. But this is not the only project in Sonora. Sonora. A few kilometers further south, there is also the Electra project of the Canadian company Rockland Resources shown in orange on this map. This company claims to have begun exploration on its electric concession. And in the report, we draw attention to the fact that this concession, according to information, public information, is not in force. This would indicate that the company carried out explorations in places where it did not have the permission from the Ministry of Econ Economy to do so. In addition to this, there are other important projects that we sh show in the report in the uh, border area of Zacatecas and San Luis Potosí and in Baja California. But before going to that, in this region, in Sonora, that has the most attention to it now because of the re very recent decree as being the first uh, reserve zone for lithium, we want to show on this map that is not in the report, but we were able to make it in time for this event and where we see this reserve zone marked with the blue perimeter and it covers not only the entire area of Bacanora Lithium, but also most of the Rockland Resources Project and even other concessions that we do not mention in the report because they have no progress in exploration. And because, as you can see in the map, these are concessions that are still being processed. That is concessions that have been applied for, but the permit has not been granted. These are the shaded areas on the map. 
in the report, we also include the mapping of prospecting sites that the Mexican Geological Service is promoting in 82 locations under the program and investments project called Exploration for Lithium and whose final or partial results are already classified as reserved information for a period of five years. Besides the usefulness of this, where we, we can see where are the communities where this mining prospecting is being done. As you can see in this map, Sonora, Puebla, Nuevo León, and Oaxaca are very notorious in this sense. Something relevant about this is that in response to our request for information, the geological service say that in all these sites, clay, clayish soils were identified. And this is relevant because this type of deposit, there is no current commercial exploitation process and this development would require, on the one hand, control of a technology that is still under development and, uh, and is right now still under the control of private uh, um, companies. And on the other hand, would con to consider the economic and environmental implications for its development will be greater. So to begin to visualize what would be involved in exploiting lithium in Mexico, which if it is true that these deposit deposits are in rock or clay soil, would generally involve the use of open pit mining, we show the following examples. Here's the example of the Thacker Pass project in the United States, which we invite you to look at in more detail but you can see in the pictures here, the modeling of what it would involve. We see digital modeling that represents what the area would look like if it were to be carried out, not only the pit, but also other components of open pit mining, which are the mountains of waste rock, leaching ponds, instead of highly toxic areas. Another uh, example, is the Sonora Lithium project would be an open pit mine of 129 hectares in addition to the millions of cubic meters of water it plans to use and for which it already has some permits, it plans to leave 131 million tons of toxic waste and 25 million tons of tailings. And we, as it is, we uh, uh, suppose that will be there forever. Isa, you have two minutes. This toxic waste will remain in perpetuity, perpetuity in the area. So finally, the report details the uncertainties and concerns that we have about the advance of this extractivist wave. In this first we're concerned, we show some maps where we show that the most of the areas of projects and prospects are in zones already affected by water risk and also with water uh, underwater aquifers that are already reporting deficit. Another area of concern is the use of public resources to promote mining and activity that is accompanied by speculative dynamics that require quite large investments. And also we have this, we're concerned about the increasing criminalization, violence and enforcement mechanisms that may occur in light of the reforms carried out, especially in the context we live in as a country where criminal violence and that of the state itself and companies operate together, particularly in mining communities, mining territories. These also, we have to look at other decrees such as that of November 2021, which orders the acceleration of the procedures required for the so-called strategic projects of the state. And to close here, to say that we understand that all of the organizations that are part of RIMA, and we also agree with Mining Watch here, we believe that what is really urgent is not to promote extractivism, but to propose a halt to the exploration, exploitation, benefit, and use of lithium and other minerals. Our position as an organization is that the true public utility of minerals is the determination to leave them in the subsoil. We, For us, for REMA, extractivism is not less bad if it's done by a, the state or a private company or international company. This we need to strengthen the self-determination of, pe of people and communities directly af affected by this. And so sorry for speaking so fast. 
Thank you so much, Isabel, for that context that you've just presented to us and that allows us to start, I think, the webinar with an under with a common understanding of how we are painting and legitimizing the mining associated with the so-called uh, trans energetic transition in Mexico and al also only what discourses. So thank you so much for presenting these findings in such a clear way. I, I know it was a lot to cover in 20 minutes. I thank you. Just a reminder for everybody that the questions box is open and do not hesitate. It will be open during an, uh, an, the webinar and at the end we will be able to answer them in whatever way we can or also answer them at the end of the event. And another reminder that includes me and all the panelists to please speak slower. It's something that we are all at fault for, just speaking too fast. I would like to hand the mic over to the Dr. Luke, Luca Ferrari I see your camera and sound is on. I would like to introduce him first. Luca Ferrari is a doctor of earth sciences from the University of Milan with a post uh, PhD from UNAM. Currently he is senior researcher C at the UNAM Geosciences Center. He is one of the coordinators of the national strategic program about energy transition for CONACYT and it's a professor in the graduate program in earth sciences and sustainability sciences and in different UNAM degrees. From since 2005, he has also been dedicated to the analysis of national and global energy system and the implications for the future and sustainability. Dr. Luca, with this wealth of technical knowledge on geology, I would like to know a little bit if more, if you could talk to us a little more about what Isabel has already mentioned in her presentation about this kind of exploitation of lithium that is happening in Mexico of clay and maybe the uncertainties that exist about the possible reserves and economic viability of its exploitation in Mexico. I also think that maybe with this knowledge that you have, it would be very interested to hear you talk about uh, some notes and reflections about this energy transition in North America and about mining for this energy transition. You have the mic, you have 20 minutes, thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation, even though it was uh, only a couple days ago, but fortunately I had some material available. I have prepared a brief presentation that will complement what Isabel already said and what the report says already. The report is something that's very useful because the criticism for the projects from the government in Mexico come from the right or from the opposition. But in this case, there are uh, under uh, critical vision, the declarations that the government has made that is supposedly leftist. But from a point of view, that is a little bit different. So I think it's very important. I wanna remind everybody that the lithium is just one of these uh, tens of elements that are critical that will be required for the, the so-called energetic transition that in the official narrative is simply a technological change to going from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. So we know that aside from the lithium, we have at least other 15, 20 elements that are very necessary for the exploitation technology for the renewable sources. The sources are renewable, but the infrastructure to take advantage of this is not. It's an infrastructure that's highly technological that needs high quantities of minerals among these lithium. But as we well know, there's the copper, the cadmium, the cobalt, zinc, aluminum, silver, uh, uh, rare, soil, etc. Something that's important to remember also when we talk about uh, energy transition to leave petroleum and gas in the sub subterrain, it's something 
fake because the reno renewable sources depend in the end in the fossil fuels in all of its stages of its life and in the case of mining it's not possible to mine without the diesel we have to remove huge quantities of rock to then process it with uh, often a high te temperature methods that require fossil fuels but also the building itself of the infrastructure for the renewable energy sources it needs concrete which you need fossil fuels for iron that 75 percent in the world is done with carbon or with natural gas maintaining of installations of all the in, in infrastructure once again is done with fossil fuels the construction of solar panels implies a whole process of high technology of purification from the cdc that uh, is done at a high temperature that particularly in china is done with carbon so this idea that we can leave in the subterrane the petroleum and the carbon and then live off of clean and uh, non-ending energy sources is fake. So as far as mining, it is also important to consider that in the in time, mining law, the concentration of the mineral will will go down because there is a, a a, a law that applies to all the non-renewable resources. First, it's seen with the most abundant things. And with time, little by little, we have less and less concentration. And here we can see how the law is going down in the, in the graph here. But this implies, yeah, that's the tendency to go down less concentration of metal in the rock. That implies that in order to have the same quantity of metal, we have to process quantities that are huge for rocks. And also the processing always implies uh, water and energy consumption. So at going down in the law, it, the, it increases exponentially the consume of water and the consume of, en of energy. We're at a stage for mining where the most wealthy findings have already ran out many decades ago. And what's left are things that are more, less and less concentration of them. So that implies quantities that we need more and more water and energy to be able to process these minerals. And now as far as lithium, that fever for lithium that is, has come of several years ago is it projects that the demand is going to grow exponentially. It's already grown in an important way after the pandemic, but at the same time, it's the, the price is going really high for lithium car carbonate, for example. Here we can see in the last four years how the price has practically uh, times five. We are even, even higher than times five in 2023. And this is mainly because of the needs of the transportation sector, but basically it's the electrical, uh, private electrical vehicles. We also have to remember that lithium uh, up until like 15, 20 years ago had a very small usage. And so the reserves that have been identified in the world, they are growing as, uh, as when the exploration keeps increasing. But currently these are the main resources and these are the main reserves the res resources don't coincide with the reserves the reserves is something much more specific that is based in the feasibility technical feasibility of recuperation as far as the cost of extraction how economic we can do it as that depends on the concentration of the mineral and the cost of energy because as we have seen if the price of petroleum goes up, the price of energy goes up that you need for mining and also for the processing of the mineral. So this, in order for it, this to be uh, 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 worth it, it has to be uh, have an enough process. It, the process has to make sense. What's important to remember, and Isabel mentioned, is that there's three kinds of lithium in the world and the ones that have been exploited are the hard rock the pegmatite that are principally uh in australia and the salat uh the salt uh, in the andes mainly the sedimentary rock where the lithium is in clay so far it has not been 
uh, profitable. Its exploitation has not been profitable, except lately in Sonora and maybe in the United States and Taco Pass. Here you can see that the places that, that are like Mexico, uh, where they have this kind of clay that's sedimentary, they're only, they only exist basically in Mexico, in the United States, and mainly in Serbia, and then Europe, in Western Europe. The lithium production is mainly in the Andes and in mainly in Chile from the hard rock in Australia and also several mines in China that also have these kinds of deposits that are uh, saline. And as far as Mexico, as we have mentioned, there is a whole series of places that are, are being explored and in its majority, if not all of them, are the lithium that's found in clay. Why is this important? Because it requires a process of concentration that is much longer and much more costly. Uh, until mid last decade, Mexico didn't have a project for exploitation of lithium and it also didn't exist the certified reserve. And currently, as has been said, the project for lithium sonora in Bacadahuachi, that's 200 kilometers from Hermosillo in the mountains, is the only one that has certified reserves. The archaeological service, as was mentioned, is exploring all of these localities in Mexico where, thanks to the pre existing mapping or studies that are pre existing, we know that there's anomalies of lithium. What's an anomaly? It's simply a place where it's shown that there's a certain concentration of lithium that's superior to the average that exists in the earth. But from that, to uh, have found a place that, that can, a, a long time can go by. And usually it's only a little bit of a part, fraction or a part of all the places that have an anomaly can be transformed truly into a place that were to mine lithium. In the exploration process and to start a mine and a process, processing plant, it requires many years. It has different stages of prospection, exploration, uh, samples about the depth and uh, and there you can see about pro probable reserves, the feasibility study that also depends on where the location is. Bacadewachi is very far away from all the services. There's a road, there's a little town, but it doesn't have, for example, the energy in the water that is needed to process the mineral that has to do, be done in this in on site. The concentrations are a, 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 a thousands of parts per million, which is less than zero point one or zero point three percent. So we can't evidently transport all of these tons of rocks towards a processing plant that is far away. Now the. The site that I have been able to visit is practically at a, some clay layers that we can see here, where you can, the, all the prospections have been made and it has found casually because the, the industry that explored here was find, trying to find borum, but they didn't find borum, but they found certain concentrations of lithium. So now uh, this is the first, site that apparently has good concentrations and it supposedly can be profitable. And however, you can see these are layers of clay. In some cases, they have high concentrations in others, much less, some don't even have any. And this is also an issue when it comes to the posterior process of concentration. The data that the industry, Bacanara Lithium presents, there are proven and probable reserves of 243 millions of rocks with concentration average of lithium of 3,480 parts per million, that's 0.34%, that translates into 1.7 millions of ton, metric tons of pro, pro, proof reserves, that is the number that always appears as far as Mexico. If you look, Mexico lithium reserve, the little number that appears are, is this, because these are the only certified reserves. Now. 
it's important to take into consideration that the processing for this mineral of the rock that has this low concentration, it goes through a lot of stages that are simplified here. You have to, to process it, liquidize, separate, dry, uh, start do it again. And there's an important process that's the calcination to 950 degrees. That's important because that implies a high temperature and those temp high temperatures, guess what? You can't do it with re renewable sources. So you have to do them with fossil fuels. And so in order to do this, the industry that is property of, of China, they foresee building an 185 kilometers to take natural gas, a, a, a gas duct from Bakadawachi to take it to a, and they also need to have wells of water to be able to extract whatever is needed for all the processes of lixiliacion and precipitation, et cetera, until we finally come to lithium carbonate. The water that would be consumed in this process is less than is used at the Salares, but it is still a consumption of water in a zone that's pretty arid as is shown in the report. We are in a zone where we have water stress. Okay, I'm ending now, but it's important to consider that if you one wants to give value to the production of lithium, we have to consider the entire chain that is associated with lithium. That is not just producing lithium carbonate, but also the batteries, batteries that aren't just useful for electric cars, although that's the main use for them, but also we have batteries, lithium batteries in our cell phones, our laptops, in any electronic devices that you can plug in, and also to store electric energy produced with renewable, variable, renewable sources like aeolic, wind power, and, and solar. So here we can see at the at a world scale what the situation is. The minerals we have the minerals for the battery because in the battery is you don't just have lithium. You also have cobalt, graphite, nickel, and then within. The indust renewable industry, there's also copper, rare earths, and so on. So in the case of the minerals, they are distributed, as you can see here in this map, mainly in the south, in the global south, in Latin America and Africa, here Turkey, in China, a large part, in Indonesia, nickel, and a little bit in Australia. Now, this is important because it turns out that this energy transition, technological and corporate corporative transition, as however we may define it, the impulse of the northern countries, especially Canada, United States, and Europe, they don't have much more fossil fuels left. And so it's not very far away the time when it won't be able to use those. Europe basically no has no more fossil fuels. And with the sanctions that they've placed on Russia, they uh, don't have gas. United States is in the last phases of final phases of exploiting petroleum, uh, non-conventional extraction of petroleum, which they could do maybe for another decade, but not after that. And Canada has uh, the tar sense that is a uh, petroleum that is very, very difficult and very contaminating to extract, expensive to produce. It's a non conventional petroleum. So that's where there is the motivation towards renewable uh, resource, uh, energy, but they need materials for the for this and the exploitation of the resources needed for this are mainly in the global south. And so there's this aspect of neo-colonialism, we could say, where the north is going to extract now the elements necessary 
for the so-called energy transition. And within the topic of batteries, it's important to keep in mind that basically China doesn't have a monopoly, but it has a great part of the lithium processing and the production of the batteries. And that's the, why Gafent bought the Bakawache mine, thinking that this would be a strategic, strategic investment. And so Mexico now is in this geopolitical situation where there starts to be a more and more intense confrontation between the United States and China, I was mentioned earlier. And the United States pressures Mexico for the lithium that we that there may be, which we don't know yet, how much is extractable or how much is profitable to extract in Mexico. They want it to not be for the Chinese, but it to be for it to be for the United States. You have one minute, Luca. Okay, thank you. I'm going to end. This is the last slide. So we're in this geopolitical situation where our energy integration with the United States, where there has been various visits of John Kerry, also a visit from Joe Biden and Trudeau recently to Sonora. The plan Sonora where they're building a mega solar park that they want to apply, but they also want to uh, uh, produce a gas, gas uh, outlet to send gas to the United States and to uh, build interconnection of solar parks in Sonora with the United States, and that's where the lithium project enters. So everything points to, uh, as they say in the report, that these projects that are being presented as nationalist projects and also ecological projects, in reality, they're part of this new dependence of Mexico on the United States, where Mexico continues to be a pro provider of commodities and, and uh, maquilador um, assembling because they assemble the things here, but they're sold in the United States. So I conclude just by saying, yes, I very much agree with the vision presented in this report that it is a new, there's nothing new really about this. Mexico continues to be subordinate to the United States now uh, with near shoring. The uh, United States doesn't want things to be produced in China, and, but rather closer like in Mexico. But unfortunately, parts of these national resources are most probably going to end up in the United States market. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luca, for this presentation. It's very complete, and I think you covered and uh, topics and went farther uh, in depth in uh, what was spoken earlier. I think it's also important to remember this regional integration. We have to remember that this project that we're think that we're talking about together, the project of lithium in Mexico, it is uh, from a neoliberal uh, capitalist project from Canada, that comes from other countries like Canada where I am. So thank you so much because I believe think this is in harmony with this. It goes together with what we have in the report. Okay, so lastly, I would like to invite Jorge Campanini. Jorge, I see that you turned on your camera. Jorge Campanini is Bolivian born in the city of Oruro. He studied environmental engineering at the Bolivian Catholic University of Cochabamba. I hope you had some good carnivals in Oruro last weekend. His professional experience is linked, of Jorge, is linked to mining socio-environmental problems, being a facilitator of environmental conflict and an environmental technician in the city of Oruro. For more than the past 10 years, he has been part of the Bolivian Documentation and Information Center, better known as CEDIP, where he is part of the research team with the goal of 
unraveling the reality of natural resources linked to mining and hydrocarbon extractivism. Jorge, as you know, and Isabel mentioned it in her first presentation, and as we also included in the report, the Mexican government has stated explicitly multiple times that the lithium project follows the paradigm of the Bolivian process. So this makes it relevant to review what has happened in Bolivia in recent years. So I think it'd be very important to have your participation today so that you can tell us a little bit, how do you see from your, uh, in research centers or social organizations and communities affected, how do you see this process of lithium mining uh, in Bolivia? Is it as good and successful as the government, as the governments like the Mexican one painted internationally? Or the Bolivian government also tries to promote? How true are these statements that we hear? I pass you the floor and you have 20 minutes. And again, a reminder for from our interpreters, if you could please speak slowly. Thank you very much, Viviana. Thank you for the invitation. I think it's urgent, this discussion and debate about what is happening in our territories with the topic of extraction of minerals. I thank Luca and Isabel for their excellent presentations. And because it opens up space for me to maybe continue the debate and the discussion, proposing specifically the uh, problem in Bolivia regarding lithium. As you said, Viviana, it has been very present recently in the media, in the agree international agreements, in the presence of governors and so on. So I'm going to try not to repeat what was already said, but to emphasize that there is a consensus on the part of universities, academic institutions, researchers, consultors, consultants, and large agencies, regulating agencies, and all of them coincide in what we've been saying, that the demand for lithium and these minerals uh, with the transition, these, the demand is going to explode. Everybody coincides that the, de depending on the mineral, it will be an exponential demand in the coming years. And this is something we've been seeing. In this table, we see what is the increase in demand uh, of, for this, for this, of these minerals. For example, for batteries and electrical cars and production of alternative energy sources. And so this is related with, in the specific case of lithium, that this demand is linked directly to electro -reno renewability, electric batteries, electric cars, and it's part of a policy that is already uh, going forward, uh, particularly in the global north. And the countries that generate these products like the Southeast Asia. And another thing I want to emphasize here is that in the case of lithium, for example, the consumption of more than 50% of lithium, and the consumption is by China. Between China and uh, South Korea and, and Japan, they produce almost half of the lithium produced in the world. So the direction is that way. And as what Luca was talking about, this demand generates in the territories, zones of sacrifice, poles of extraction, zones, uh, uh, of of difficulty, the participation of transnationals and the role of the states and the participation uh, of their collaboration and all the conflicts that we see in this time. This uh, image here shows the principal products that China demands in this case from South America. So China is the uh, biggest consumer of 
iron and soy, soy from Brazil, petroleum from Ecuador, copper, and, and now lithium from Ecuador and Chile. That's being, mass, being massified, deepened. Various operations, prospects, operations, especially what they call, badly called the lithium triangle. It's a zone of high eco ecological stress, strongly linked to the desert of Takana. There's a lot of uh, original, um, uh, original peoples, indigenous populations, and is currently object or focus of these interests. As I commented earlier, this is ju just showing us the big areas and just uh, what China uses, we must add to this, what other resources that are extracted and other uh, interests, and we would have a much more complete map. But what we're seeing here is the demand, uh, especially by the global north and the countries with the power to transform natural resources that generate this kind of configuration, territorial configuration. And as a preamble to the case in Bolivia, as Luca said, lithium is extracted from rock, clay, also from the salares, and in the salares are the salmueras that has lithium, other met metals, and water. It's a it's a heavy solution. And it has the procedure of extracting this water that's in the salt fields and evaporated with the solar energy, which classically is done. And the salts that are gotten from that are then processed. The, the liquidation, there's, a, there's an entire procedure that as far as the characteristics for the brine and lithium that exists is different. Each salt field in Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, it has different physiochemical characteristic, characteristic. The salt field in Atacama is the most prosperous, productive in the region. And the impurities that come with the lithium are less as far as as the salt field, salt field I mentioned before, the, of a uni. And so the processes are much quicker, not as complex. As far as the salt field in a uni, it has been determined that for each unit of lithium, there's 20 unities of magnesium. And this impurity is complex because it needs to be separated for the extraction of clean carbonate and the products that are gonna be taken from the same. And so each salt field has different characteristics, and so they need uh, treatments in different parts of the process that are different. In the Bolivian case, we have the biggest salt field in the world, and it has been quantified, and I, I, I'll mention this later, the presentation of Bolivia, it was, that it was the amount of brine and of liquid that can be taken from the same. And we'll see what has happened with all of this. Currently, Bolivia since the 80s has the intention of exploiting its salt field and to have measures and policies as far as companies or industries in 1989, we had a famous Lithco in Bolivia that signed a contract for the exploitation of the salt field that uh, didn't work because the Bolivian state wanted to increase the taxes and the rates for the industry. And so they left. Lithco then uh, was called the FM, FMC and now it's called Librem, which is an, an American industry and in 2008 with Evo Morales it has been retaken in a way the idea has come back the of the exploiting 
the uni salt field and to declare this as an, a strategic resource and there's been a normalizing framework that has been constructed for that is logistical and that will uh, achieve this task in some way among these elements is for example the constitution or the construction of a national industry for and for it to realize and with a legal mandate to be able to develop the concentration of lithium the extraction of the lithium carbonate as a prime matter and then to be able to do associations per, uh, for uh, and for foreign industries to be able to participate the uni salt field all the salt fields that are declared as a fiscal reserve so the state can operate in them with their industry and in this case the places that has lithium in bolivia and so this industry has been created through the law and it continues a work that has was started from the national industry of mining which is the corporacion minera de bolivia mining corporation of bolivia so this whole strategy that has been drawn as was shown previously in since 2006 2008 it has had the result of the establishment of initially of a network of exploitation and transformation of a pilot stage of lithium uh, and it's a pilot stage because it's not being able to to go into an industrial level and we're going to show more or less why and what has been the cause as far as resources in 2019 bolivia published the data that there is a characterization of the quantity of lithium that exists in uyuni and it turns out that the uni salt field has the biggest quantity 21 million tons of lithium but this watch out is the is in 2019 the lithium project both at its pilot stage and the beginning of or the start of industrial projects that happened in 2012 to 18. so we have projected uh plants in this case industrial sites without getting to know or without knowing certain with certainty what amount of reserves this uh, salt field has in the uh, uni salt field doesn't appear in any report any study there's no information in bolivia as far as what is the certification officially of reserves that this salt field has so Luca mentioned in his presentation that there's a difference that's significant as far as reserves and resources. The resource is the data, the information. It can make us infer how what amount of mineral we have and the resources is how much of that mineral or of that resource can we transform or can we extract, can we commercialize? So that doesn't exist in Bolivia. And in order to do mining, uh, to do business, what is needed and what is usually applied is the reserves. And that doesn't exist yet. So Bolivia projected its lithium strategy without first having the reserves and knowing many years later an approximation as far as resources. And that's one of the biggest problems for which up until today, what Bolivia has is just uh, pilot uh, places uh, of potassium chloride and for batteries that produce small quantities, small units, as far as the topic of propaganda or things like that. Industrials. Uh, sites for uh, solar evaporation, we only have the uh, potassium chloride, which is a fertilizer that is also uh, obtained from exploiting brine, and it has an intermediate phase before getting lithium, you have this product. 
the industrial site was planned for a production of 7,000 tons a year. And uh, lastly, it was built with a production capacity of half of that, 350,000. And they don't, currently they don't even, it doesn't even have the 20% of the production as far as its capacity. And the lithium carbonate factory is recently in its last phases of construction. They say that this year is gonna be built with a capacity of 14,000 to 15,000 tons a year. And why I mentioned this is that in the moment that the strategy was designed for the lithium strategy, G in Bolivia as our presentation card was the the Saltfield Uni and in that moment over 10 years ago our intention was or the intention from Bolivia was it was to compete with our neighbors with Argentina and Chile whose levels of productions were more or less around the 14,000 15,000 tons now currently the situation has changed Argentina has gone what far and above chile has doubled and almost tripled their levels of production so it's been over 10 years in which bolivia hasn't been able to implement an industrial process in this case concretely of concentration of lithium uh, we've had the topic as far as Germany and China, that before the political, social political crisis of 2019, it was built specifically in Germany, there was a mixed industry to be able to process the residues or the residual brine for all the lithium project and to be able to produce hydroxide in some way to be able to get to a semi-industrial level and also with the uh, business watching in china is to do the same and to amplify the construction of sites and factories and uh, in other salt fields coipas and pastos grandes who are the ones that come as uh in the next sequence of importance as i said we only have one site industrial site of potassium chloride that is working 20 percent capacity and there's some um, pilot sites that in some way represent the national production. Something that I wanted to mention also, and I think is important and is getting us together now are the climate risks. First and foremost, sadly, getting information in Bolivia, information about the industry and the state, it's harder and harder. And it's been very difficult to be able to access the uh, the climate impact for the industrial plants for put, for potassium chloride and lithium carbonate to be able to know the severity of the climate impacts amongst them, just to mention the uh, project of lithium in a zone of uh, low water content or water stress, it can consume more water than a mine that's open skies because at the end of the day lithium or the extraction of lithium is a, a water mining or that's what it's called water mining because of these characteristics that the brine has so in a zone that's pretty critical to intensify and and deepen these type of activities has a lot of uh, impacts and also something that we have uh, find analyzing these studies is that the information, the hydrogeological information it isn't there. When the studies were made, that didn't exist. The, the, geo, the hydrogeological information wasn't there. The climate impacts, they have basically, they, 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 can, they can be worse just to see it easier and another element that's easier is that the indigenous communities that surround and are close to the zone that's being exploited they didn't have previous consultation even though there's organizations and communities and indigenous towns that are recognized by the state and 
that have that they even have the resources for processing of water to take all the way to the site or to the zone where the sites are going to be built and they haven't gotten the sufficient information necessary information to be able to in some way demand the rights that they that the community should have in front of the state and the industries and just to close i will close now there have uh, 13 years have gone by the biggest investment in mining that the Bolivian state has done in history hasn't even recovered even half and this failure has been manifested that i have been that i have mentioned in 2001 when bolivia decides to completely change its strategy and to call foreign industries to be able to implement te extraction technologies for lithium that are very different to the evaporation that we mentioned earlier like the like the pools uh, the brine pools that i mentioned earlier but technologies that selectively extract lithium from the brines, like I mentioned, and they have presented several businesses and then an agreement on January 20th has, uh, there was an agreement that was signed with one of the biggest Chinese companies for production and commercialization of battery. There's a conglomerate of Chinese businesses for direct extraction of lithium in the Unico and Pasa uh, salt field. So in a way, Bolivia has thrown away its own project of 10, 13 years. And now it's betting on the fact that it's not really clear under what legal figure, under what condition, and especially with, an, with a consortium that doesn't have experience in lithium extraction and the direct extraction of lithium, there's not a lot of knowledge as far in the world as far as an industrial scale extraction and so it's now going to go into a new adventure i'll finish with this just to have it really clear this is the comparison of the production in bolivia argentina and chile in 2017 as you can see the the pilot site what bolivia produces is symbolic which has now uh, been publicized are the prices because of the price of lithium, there's been a, a higher sale maybe. But as far as materials as such, the next to our neighbors is still really low and the climate issues and climate risks for what both the conclusion of the project of evaporation as well as what the, pro the extraction projects will be it especially in this last one it generates a lot of uh, doubts about it more doubts than certainties thank you so much for the invitation and sorry if i went too bad no not at all thank you for participating in this event i think we're very happy of, to have had everybody's participation and, and we have lots of questions among them questions for all of the speakers there's so much interest about what we're talking about today that many people are asking if you can share your powerpoint presentations so if you agree we can later send your presentation to them as well as the report the summary of the report and the communique that rema has uh, written about the report but we will cover that later in the event. We have, we'd like to open this space for a couple of questions of, from the people who have joined this event. I know some of the questions have already been answered, some of the questions in the Q&A box, but I'd like to see if there's any more questions in the chat that maybe have not been answered. Perhaps one that has not been answered yet is we are asked about the prospecting of lithium. I think it was responded to already, but if you could go into a little more detail, the topic of lithium prospecting, if it's only 
done by the SGM or also participated or uh, other mining companies uh, participate? Isa or Luca, would you like to respond to that question? I could start at this moment. It's the Geological Service, SGM, the Mexican Geological Service. Previously, the mining change that was made in Mexico, lithium was a concession like all the other minerals. And so there were private businesses, private enterprises who were doing the prospecting and in the prospecting and, and exploration. But after the change, when my when lithium has been uh, um, separated for the state, this geological service that's part of the Mexican government that is doing the systematic exploration of the the potential for the sites where there's anomalies. I am understanding, perhaps Isabel know better, that the other uh, companies have not made any explorations in recent years, apart from what Gaffin did. Maybe, maybe they know more about the situation. Yes, in the report, it is detailed. Some of the cases that we presented there, there is exploration at least from three other companies. But as Lucas said, this was done before, as far as we know, the public data is that this was done before the 2022 reform. Excuse me. In effect, now there is lith lithium MX. It was created with a decree last year, this state enterprise, but it really doesn't have its own budget. It depends on the uh, on the Secretary of Energy, and it depends on the Geological Service. Maybe in the future there could be the possibility that Lithium MX have it have its own exploration division, but that's not the case now. Thank you, Luca and Isa. Maybe another two questions that are similar to each other. I'm going to put them together. The first says, from the judicial, from the legal point of view, what can we do? to uh, put into law the, the how will be the treatment of the owners of the land and, and uh, taking away land from people who own the land where they want to do prospecting. Isa, would you like to talk? Yes. Formally, all of this has to do with subsoil. And there's always everything to do with sub, on what's underground. We always have the problem of who lives on the ground, not just in lithium, but in any mineral, there's a property, the possibility of expropriation. But in Rema, we have no registry of this having happened. It's more possible and more risk of this sort of impositions uh, because of the reforms that have happened considering it now a strategic and public utility, strategic uh, resource. So the owners of the land continue to be sub subjects of law and they have the possibility to decide if a mining company uh, enters or no. Particularly, this operates in the agrarian nuclei where the landowners are collective. So who has to be asked permission is not individuals, but the whole general assembly of the village. So that's why in Rema, we focus so much in making informational processes, informational events in these decision-making spaces and these uh, autonomous governing bodies of the communities with, so that they can take decisions before the mining company comes. There are various permits that uh, don't just have to do with the direct owners of the land, but also permits that are they need that are municipal. So the strategy of REMA is, is uh, their legal strategy is to make municipal uh, bills or municipal laws. It's not just REMA doing this, but but it's something that we are promoting. That decisions be made before these projects even start. Thank you, Isa. 
Uh, so a couple other questions. Uh, some questions about the company Lithium MX that I'm going to put together. One says, you mentioned in the report that we launched today that there are people who applaud the creation of Lithium MX as a landmark in national sovereignty and the control of national sovereignty and the control of lithium. But but here you say that who's really benefiting are other governments, the government of the United States and Canada. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? In truth, who is the one who is really benefiting from the creation of lithium MX? And the other very uh, related question is the creation of lithium MX. Seems like it makes the Mexican government a collaborator of all the authorized lithium extraction in the future. But so they have no interest interest in detaining it or in protecting the communities. Is that correct? About this last uh, point, uh, latter point is true. The the uh, association that the state can do with private companies, we can suspect that they're going to do. The president has said many times that this is project requires private investment. And that's what we uh, point out in the report. But beyond knowing if he's going to go with one side or the other or with all of them at the same time, it depends what these companies decide. Also, we must look at the commercial, the, the business um, agreements in, uh, in the free trade agreement also gives possibilities to sue the government, not only if the, if the government is exploiting these resources on its own, but in an idyllic, a utopian case for us that will, would propose limiting governments. That is also within the framework of the, of the free trade agreement within our perspective. I would only add that unfortunately, it does look like it's going in that direction that Isabel mentions, because also the supposed nationalization of lithium was done more as a, a political argument than really something that would concretely benefit the state uh, economically. But the problem is that when it's the nation's interest, you can expropriate land and you can also go with the entire uh, force of the state over the rights of individuals and the rights of communities. Unfortunately, we have seen this in some projects of the state. But when it's a company, an uh, international or a Mexican company, then it's a little harder for them to. So all of this is a little dangerous. If there's no serious pressure to proceed according to laws, which are not the best, but at least it's what we have for legal defense in Mexico. Thank you. I see two questions for Jorge from Sedip. It said, the first one says, uh, are there any real possibility that Bolivia becomes a protagonist in the international market for lithium? And truly, is there no alternative more creative alternatives uh, for alternative resources, alternative energy that does not uh, imply contamination of resources. And I ask if the techno-scientific uh, progress doesn't uh, allow us to make resources, alternative energy in ways that also either use uh, mm, fossil fuels or resources that destroy communities. Wow. Well, uh, Bolivia has its its main bet, its main card, game card is to get out of this scheme, get out of this scheme of being a, a, a primary, uh, a raw prod, a raw material uh, producer and industrialize its resources and to even make electric cars in Bolivia, but the this technology, it's not just lithium, it's copper, graphite, and many other minerals that if we had them all, okay, let's say we do have them. We also have them uh, pure concentrated states. 
copper, for example, Bolivia does not have the technological capacity to make, to produce copper wire or copper bars. So all of the components of the batteries we have to import if we want to make our own technology. And to develop this technology and manufacturing capacity, we are not in the possibility to do that. The only gamble that we have, the only is to replace this because I don't think this is something that will happen, is to replace this with volume being extracted. And even so, it's difficult because since we don't have an ocean, that makes transport very expensive to transport it to ports and the competitiveness that Bolivia wants to have with its neighboring countries, uh, it gets yeah, it gets uh, it's not as competitive. So I see it very difficult given the situation and the conditions as as it is now. The way out that is proposed is a way out in terms of the industrialization of the product, so processing it. But many authorities would confuse having an industrial plant of concentrating lithium carbonate, uh, they would confuse that with transforming the, the raw material, but that's not the case. The second question that I think is very interesting because uh, it seems very important to me for the past years, but especially last year, the reports of PPA has shown us something worrisome. Instead of diminishing our uh, our dependence on fossil fuels, our dependence has gone up. The production of petroleum and gas uh, and the demand also has gone up. All of the talk, uh, environmental talk, and about climate change and the COPs fall. It's a it becomes a topic that we could discuss. Lithium is not a force of a source of energy yet. It is a, a, play, a way to store energy, and it can store energy that can come from fracking, from oil from the Amazons, from invaded territories, destroyed territories. It just stores energy. Lithium as an energy is still a scientific paradigm that has not yet been able to. Uh, to be reality, lithium plus three or nuclear diffusion. Right now, it's just a, a way to store energy. And in this context, I think that our society and humanity is in a very difficult crossroads. And to bet on making more mining and to deepen the extractivist way of working and to destroy more territories, we also say this is not the way out. Thank you so much, Jorge. I'm conscious of the time. So I wanna make sure that all the questions are in one. I'm gonna ask one more question that I think encompasses several of the questions and we'll finish with that and we'll close. The question says, can you talk a little bit about the role that the free trade agreement between Mexico, U.S. and Canada has the famous free trade agreement. Uh, as far as the projects of lithium in Mexico, what will the mining industries have? And in what, in the way that these influence the speculation about lithium that's manifesting in Mexico? Well, some ideas for a very, a uh, broad question, let's say, uh, recovering what you'll be able to see in the report. The reforms that have happened as far as the essential parts or the core parts of the auto industry is what we see that is key to understand. Luca mentioned this also, why it is urgent for the auto industry for the automobiles that want to have, that want to be favored by, by, by this, this trade zone 
that's taking off taxes and and fees for the product commerce commerce one of the basic parts is the lithium batteries and in that sense we understand the presence that's that's almost the mentorship that not only the US government, but also the industries. Uh, there's some disputes about who is Tesla's gonna st stay if Tesla's inversion, investment, if it's gonna stay in Monterrey and Nuevo León, or if it's gonna stay in the Tehuantepec, Itzmo. There's a clear uh, divergence there. And at the end of the day, it's not completely resolved how and in what direction the production is going. It's a profile that has to do with this articulation of the production of cars in the US. But at the end of the day, we don't know yet why these concessions are the more advanced. Whether well, they are concessions, some of them are viable for private industries. So whatever the the position that Gangheng has has the business it's a Chinese business it, it'll depend on them and also on the Mexican state and to not sell to China and instead sell to the United States for example yeah I think that this last decree from a few days ago it's pretty much a way of pressuring the industry in a negotiation that I think is gonna is trying to happen with the with China to do some to to create an agreement for a joint production under the supervision of the state and the sovereignty of the state. But uh, at the end of the day, wherever they invest, because I don't think in this moment the Mexican state has the capital to risk a production where. They don't have the technology because the technology is patented by Gaffing. And so I think that uh, possibly there'll be an agreement which under the framework of Lithium and MX, but really who is developing this is a private industry that's transnational. It might be Chinese. That's what's most probable, probable. Well, thank you so much. I would like to thank everybody, first and foremost, you, the panelists, for your time, the effort that you've put in to the presentation. Thank you so much. I echo the comments in the chat for the participants that are congratulated for such an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I think all of us have learned a lot to, Today, there's a lot of interest in this subject matter. It's a very important subject matter because we know, as Jorge mentioned, there's some uh, last intervention. The lithium subject is something that's very, or it's it's very in in fashion, for lack of a better word, with this subject that we need mining to for energetic transition and how the solution uh, in front of this climate crisis that's affecting us north and south and from east to west. So I think it's very important, everything that you've shared with us today. And I feel like it's very important from Canada to be able to hear the, the impact, how it's being lived, This, the discourses that we hear and that are promoted by governments like the Canadian one next to the mining industry in Canada that tell us here in Canada that it's necessary, this mining is necessary but that I feel that not a lot of people here that we live in we live in Canada we don't realize how this materializes in the territory as far as a lack of respect to the rights to collective rights to self determination for indigenous people and the destruction of territories so once again thank you so much for your presentations and for sharing with us so to share, I would also like to tell you all that the report we will be sending through an email for all the people that register for the event. We're going to do a follow up email and you will find the report there, a summary that we've prepared 
for the report in English and Spanish. As far as a very powerful communique from Rema, which has launched in the last 30 minutes. So be, uh, you can wait for that soon. And thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this, this, it doesn't happen very often that everybody that gets together from the first minute is still with us at the end. So thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Thank you for our interpreters. Thank you so much. And to everyone, both from the REMA team, as well as the Mining Watch Canada team that work behind the scenes to be able to make this possible. Thank you all so much. Have an excellent night. And we will be in contact with you to follow up to the dialogue in this meeting. Thank you so much. Good night.